So, when you were a young girl, Christine, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do with your life? I don't remember for much at the time having any idea about that, but I can remember a phase, I think I must have been about five, when I went around announcing I was going to be a lady scientist. Ooh. Quite why lady scientist? I mean, not, not very PC nowadays, but that was my, um, my stated ambition at five. I'm afraid that wasn't to, uh, wasn't to be, didn't turn out to be my thing. So when it comes to faith, what exposure to faith did you have when you were a young girl? Very little, actually. I, I didn't grow up in a faith family. My mother, I can, um, looking back, I can see my mother did have uh, quite a strong faith, but it was one of those situations where she you know, didn't go to church, but she just had that faith there. And when I was very small, she would pray with me when I was going to bed. Uh, my father, the most gentle, kind man you could uh, ever meet, but absolutely uh, had no sympathy with religion. I think he was one of the people who thought, I think it brings more intolerance in the world and it's not a good thing on balance. So, you know, quite a mixed family. So grew up in that in that way and didn't discover faith as an adult until I was probably, I think it must have been about late 20s. That's quite amazing that you yeah. went through all that period. And during that time, had you been to church services at all, perhaps Christmas carol services or anything like that? No. Um, in the family, we really didn't do that. I went to a few church services for friends' weddings. And then I suppose my first beginning to experience church was when I myself was engaged and was thinking about marriage and where that would be, the wedding. And my husband, who was not a churchgoer either, we felt we should go to be married in a registry office. That was about your only option in those days if you weren't being married in church, no no castles or anything. And that seemed the logical thing to do. But I felt very strongly that I needed something more special in terms of meaning. Not not special pretty, but meaning. That's really fascinating, isn't and it? And so I stumbled into a, the, the little local church and introduced myself to the vicar and said, you know, um, I was hoping to marry there, and started attending matins, prayer book matins, which is what that church had at 11 o'clock, little village church. And I loved it. And, and we were married there. And my mum later told me that she'd gone on a day trip with the women's group to Salisbury Cathedral and she'd prayed that I would change my mind and be married in church, not in a registry office. So, well, God, just isn't that paving wonderful? the way there with a little, little answer to prayer in spite yeah, of the fact you hadn't wonderful? been in my a church. My husband very graciously agreed that we could be married in church, which was... What an incredible lovely. story. Yeah. So, obviously, here you are, loving the experience of Matins, uh, not perhaps what everybody would enjoy, no. clearly something that struck a chord with you. So how did that faith develop then, Christine? Well, after we got married, we got married by today's standards, we got married very young. Um, and how old were you? I was 19 when I got married. Wow, still 16 a 16 when I met my husband. Gosh. Um, uh, it's interesting, I was just listening to your reflections about uh, the number of people who sadly now find, uh, women find they can't conceive, and, and that's such a, a prevalent thing and the heartbreak it brings. And I certainly wouldn't commend anybody to be married quite as young as I was. <laughs> it was more usual then than it is now. Um, but I do think now we hit a lot of unhappiness, actually, particularly for women, where men seem reluctant to commit and women find themselves um, moving beyond their most fertile period. Uh, and a lot of people find that in their 40s, it's possibly too late and they're not, they may have had a chance earlier. And I think there's a lot of heartbreak around this. And I think it's something in our culture we ought to get back in touch with saying, come on, um, commitment is a good thing. Yeah, so finding a way of communicating that message yes. and maybe even the changing yes. the way we do things. Yeah, so that was a bit of a diversion. Yes. <laughs> but, but finding faith, I we had our two children um, within the, the first few years of being married. And I went through, to be honest, quite a... We moved house just after our second child was born. It was quite a lonely period. So it's a hard time, actually. And it was at that point that I thought, Do you know... I really need to think about the big questions. Is there any meaning greater than just this little family we're in? Is there anything bigger than this? And I opened, I think what I did was open myself up for God to touch me with that, um, with that reality. And I did have an extraordinary, uh, overwhelming experience of God's love, 
which I was tempted to explain away because it was changing my life. <laughs> but I knew that if I did explain it away, I'd be betraying something very important. So I grabbed my four-year-old's hand and went to church and encountered a fantastically vibrant congregation. And that was the beginning of, well, the next bit of my life. Woman to woman, it's time to talk. Now, just before the break, uh, we just heard how Christine actually didn't enter into a church until quite late in life. And we had Brett phone up to say that he didn't enter a church for the first time until the age of 32. He said he had an encounter with God and that was what prompted him to go into church. He said he was the biggest sinner ever. He said he used to swear a lot, but that sense of God got him into church and his life turned around. Christine, we tend not to hear many people coming into church late in life, do we? Well, it's, it's interesting, particularly at the age that I was and that Brett was, that's a gap in, in, in churches in many places. And so Brett and I are unusual in that research shows that um, if you come to faith, you're likely to do that before the age of 25. But it just shows that God can uh, work in all kinds of situations. So it's lovely to hear Brett's story. So we reached this, this moment where you and your daughter headed off to church. You had a fantastic warm welcome. Things obviously went well, and I assume you continued attending church. So when did ordination come into it all? Well, um, I was, first of all, had to be confirmed, uh, which is in the Church of England is how you become able to receive communion and, and, and make an adult ascent to Had faith. you been baptised? I had as a baby. My grandmother had insisted on that. So, bully for grandmothers. <laughs> uh, I now have four grandchildren, so I'm um, you know, definitely in favour of grandmothers. Uh, I soon became fascinated by learning more and more about faith. And um, so I... Uh, was very fortunate. In, I was in St Albans Diocese at that time. There was a, a course that was open to people exploring ministry, exploring faith. You had to make no commitment to seeking ordination before you went on the course, but it was life transforming. And of course, in those days, we're talking the early 80s, women couldn't be deacons, priests or bishops. So in the early 80s, I became a deaconess working in a village, which uh, was the start of my my time in ministry so it was a pretty rapid journey actually and how did your family react to all of this i mean you mentioned your husband your parents yeah, and everyone else yeah. sort of weren't in the faith it must well, be quite difficult um interest my husband was just very generous very gracious slightly bemused <laughs> that the woman he'd married was suddenly changing direction in such you know an, a significant important way but hugely supportive and has been right from that time um, to now, you know, where we are up in Newcastle. My father was the funny one, actually, because although he was so, in a way, anti-church, he, he was he was pretty proud. It, it, it was a funny kind of contradiction. And, and mum, too, of course. You know, so. Wow, well, it's so amazing you've managed to stick the course in spite, yes. in spite of it. I think friends also surprised and bemused, really. <laughs> <laughs> What's happened to Christine? What's happened to Christine, you know? <laughs> Now, I mentioned earlier on something that would make people think it's okay, Christine is normal. I mentioned that you are a big Newcastle United football fan, yeah. even to the point where you have a season ticket. But, but does it go as far as having a football shirt? It may now that, this is a little bit controversial, it may now that Newcastle has changed their sponsor. Um, I've had a scarf up till now. Okay, so um, you've had a scarf. I'm not a true Chris football fan in that true football fans have their their, their team from birth almost until death whereas I've always ministered in places where football is really important to people and so I and I enjoy going to football I love the kind of whole the whole atmosphere of it and I wanted to show that in the church we're not contemptuous about the things that matter to people but we celebrate human flourishing and living in all its fullness so i have uh, newcastle obviously is a team now you couldn't be in bishop of newcastle and not support the <laughs> team uh, but i have a wonderful time at a season ticket last year so we saw them go up to the premiership and now we're all holding our breath to see what happens this season i guess uh, some would be stuck though if they were working in manchester you've got manchester city or manchester united well you that's a pick, problem isn't you? it you're probably better off then sticking with the team you had in the last town <laughs> Now, obviously, we heard that you got to this point where you became a deaconess, uh, and obviously, yeah. eventually, were able to be ordained uh, to be to be a priest as well. At what point did you start to think, "Hang on a minute, I want to get involved in discussions and prayer and campaigning for the possibility of women to become bishops one day"? Um, fairly early on, actually, as a deaconess, I I think it was probably uh, during my training, to be honest, that I thought that a sense of call. God's call to me at first I thought I can't be being called to be a priest because the church doesn't have women priests 
And then I began to realise that God isn't confined by um, our institutions, even as significant and sacred an institution as the church. So I did really begin to sense that God might be calling me to be a priest. And even if God wasn't calling me to be a priest, I could quite clearly see other women around me who clearly um, had that um, that character that God, um, I was sure, would be calling them. And so that's when I began to see that I love the Church of England and I would always work loyally with it, but I was beginning then to work for change from the inside. What were some of the objections that people were, were giving as to reasons why you shouldn't be getting involved yeah. in all this? But broadly and to simplify, two broad, broad strands. Um, from the very evangelical wing of the church, um, reference would be made to scripture, which would say women must keep silent in church, um, a man is head of a woman, you know, the, 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 the pastoral epistles, etc. And then, I mean, some quite solid arguments. And then on the other side, from the very Catholic end of the church, would be a sense that a woman could not represent Christ at the altar because Christ Christ was male. So you had these two quite different theological arguments, um, but but nevertheless both were arguing, you know, on those grounds. So now that you are in a position of bishop, what are some of the challenges being a woman in that role? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? The Church of England, I think, I'm so thankful, we seem after years and years and years to have found a way to go forward together agreeing to disagree. And there's something really important called the five principles, which I live by, which means that we respect one another's perspectives and we we work for each other's mutual flourishing. That's a great sign to the world, I think. Um, So that's obviously key to me in my work as a bishop. But, you know, interestingly, somebody asked me this the other day. I don't very often think about being a female bishop. I've got, you know, the the, the challenge is being a bishop. (laughs) And I I'm not sure that there's more challenge if you're female than there is if you're male. It's an extraordinarily privileged, wonderful, joyful challenge. But there's, there is, you know, quite a lot to keep one out of mischief. Well, we're going to find out just now what you get up to to keep you out of mischief. And I guess no day is the same, but we'll find out what maybe an average day might be like in the life of a bishop. But, I mean, how did you find out that you were going to become a bishop? I'd love to hear what happened. Well, well that was this is the really extraordinary thing um, in that... In, I had, was an archdeacon in South East London in Southwark Darcy's, loved it there for 11 years and came into my, I love that age group of women which had always thought, you know, 60 looks quite a good retirement age. I was a bit <laughs> older than that, but, you know, I'd grown up expecting that. And I just thought I really owe to my husband now to spend some time with him. And so I retired very happily, um, carried on working to see the women bishops legislation through, quite sure it was nothing to do with me. And I had three years of amazing retirement. Um, but when the measure got passed and, and bishops all over the place were asked to recommend women who might be ready now to become bishops, my then bishop phoned me up to say, unless you tell me um, that I can't, I am going to put your name forward. And so that was the most actually, I was, I've never been quite as astonished and taken aback and challenged actually to say how should I respond to this? Yes. But in the end, much as I was re- enjoying my retirement, and I really was, it was amazing, um, I felt I had to be open to the Holy Spirit. Mm. So when you finally got told, OK, this is it, Christine, did you have to keep it secret? Yes, that is a really difficult time because um, it's quite a few months when you're not really not supposed to tell anybody apart from your husband or your wife or and your bishop. And it means that you feel torn apart because you know that there are friends, very dear friends, who will feel quite, you know, when you when it eventually comes out, they'll say, oh, couldn't you have shared that with me? Did you not trust me? And you can't. You can't share it. So it's a tough old time. Yeah, very difficult one. Well, we're going to find out in just a moment how life has changed since Christine became a bishop and what a day in the life of a bishop is like. We do appreciate, of course, not every day is going to be the same, but what kind of things do you get up to each day then, Christine? The day always begins with morning prayer. And if I'm at home, I'm really fortunate to have a little chapel in our house and my chaplain prays with me. And that's very special. And I realise how blessed I am to have that. After that, quite seriously, it could be anything. I'm trying to um, be very focused about how I use my time. It'd be very easy just to kind of go off on things that I enjoyed but in the diocese we're really focusing on a, on a vision and which is growing church bringing hope 
And that's very much a sense that we're trying to discern God's will for us, knowing that it's all comes from God. God gives us the growth. But it's our job to work with God and plant and tend and nurture and bring hope where hope's thin on the ground. So in whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to say, is this contributing to our longing to grow church and bring hope in in that wider sense so that can lead to me doing a whole variety of things and sometimes i have to do things that don't contribute to that which really don't but the thing i like doing i can't i don't like being stuck behind a desk so i do that as little as possible and i get out and i engage with people where they are and so as a bishop you're very privileged because you're invited in to places. So in Newcastle, I've been to visit the Greggs factory. Um, oh, bonuses. And, 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 and being a bishop. Kind, <laughs> all kinds of things where you can talk to people and begin to understand the realities of their lives. So I feel... I need to really be a exercise spiritual leadership, encourage all the people over the diocese, the Christians, the churches, relate to other faiths, relate to other denominations, do our ecumenical work together. But perhaps particularly, I'm really, really um, concerned to find ways that we can talk about the good news of Jesus Christ in ways that don't put people off, but resonate with people's lives that sound authentic. Now, of course, it, over, over the course of the diocese, you're going to have all different expressions of the Church of England. You know, the Church of England is a diverse beast. You've got, you know, one church will look very different to another in terms of their, their worship, their style, their preaching and so on. Uh, a lot of people concerned that maybe the Church of England might be experiencing, you know, some, some upset because of discussions recently, whether there might be splits and so on. Is that something you feel that you as a bishop need to be aware of in your diocese, of kind of trying to foster some sort of unity between all the different diversity of it all? I think we have got to find ways to disagree well. Uh, but I think, essentially, I think we all need to show a profound respect to one another. My own sense is, is that the more we realise how much God loves us, each one of us, the more we're able to be confident in relating to others, whom God also loves very deeply. And it's something, it sounds simplistic, but I don't think it is. It's about having that sense that God deeply loves me and deeply loves you, Maria, you know, and, and that's how we relate to each other. <laughs> Now, being in a position of bishop rather than sort of based in a local church, I'm guessing you probably don't get to preach quite as much, do you? I preach more, honestly. Really? Yeah, really, I do. Because I'm generally in a, often two churches every Sunday. Wow. And um, trying to visit places around the diocese. So this is by choice. You're going to visit the churches to see what things are like yeah, on the ground. Or, or maybe they're having a confirmation. Maybe they're having um, a special anniversary service and they'd love the bishop to come. Or maybe they're a vicar, they're having a vacancy and they're being months without a vicar and I go to show support. So, and very often there'll be midweek times when I have to preach. I sometimes think quite seriously that um, it's almost, we, one needs to be disciplined again not to preach too much because you can hear one's own voice. <laughs> rather too often. I think sometimes bishops need to be a bit silent. Mm, oh, that's, that's a good line there. Sometimes bishops need to be a little bit silent. And you mentioned, of course, you've got a chaplain to support you. Yes, but in right. terms of other people in your life to try and keep you grounded so you don't get kind of, you know, lofty ideas or oh, I'm, I'm the bishop and I can go anywhere, even to the Greg's factory. You know, have you got some people in place to try and help Absolutely. you make sure, remember who the real Christine yeah. is? <laughs> the, the key person is my husband, actually, and my family. I have two daughters, both married to lovely men, grandchildren, and they have no illusions. <laughs> uh, I mean, they love me as mum, as grandma, as wife. And I have a lovely little team in the house, which is my chaplain, and Leslie, who is my PA, and Ruth, who assists her. And it's it's a happy team, actually. And we don't stand on any ceremony with each other. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. You've got those people in your life. And just finally, I mean, obviously, being a bishop, I guess, is, is kind of your, your job, as it were. But how has life changed since you've taken on this role? <laughs> I think it's quite extraordinary that here I am in my 60s and my life has changed more than it's ever done before. Um, I'm now living up in Newcastle and I love the North East. I absolutely love it. Well, that's a relief really, isn't it? It's wonderful. <laughs> but Northumberland and Newcastle itself, North Tyneside, extraordinary and beautiful. Um this week I'm in the House of Lords because I'm a bishop. As a bishop, I'm one of the house, uh, bishops in the House of Lords. Who would have imagined that could happen? <laughs> you know. Um, so I have the most extraordinarily privileged, joyful thing to be uh, in the role I'm in. And I'm determined to use it to the very best of my ability to further God's saving work.
Well, it's been absolutely fascinating chatting to you today, Christine. We could have talked a lot more, I'm sure. Lots more stories from your life. But thank you for joining us and God bless you in your continued role as Bishop. And God bless you in all you're doing. Thank you.